And in the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 1, I'm going to talk to you today about the chaos that's going to occur in the last days. I'm going to let you be seated because I'm going to read several verses this morning. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now go down, if you will, in verse number 12 of the same chapter. Verse number 12 of chapter 3, Yea, all those that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue. He said, all this stuff's going to happen. What's your job? But continue. Brothers and sisters, Second Timothy is the mea culpa book of the apostle Paul. It is the final chapter in the life of a man that has written the majority of the New Testament. And in just a few hours, an iron ledge will be put up against one side of Paul's neck and an iron axe will be measured against the other side, severing the head away from the very life of this man that met the Lord on the road to Damascus. And ever since he met the Lord on that day to Damascus, he has been a blazing champion for the glory of Jesus Christ. He's going to write one more letter, and this time he's going to write it to his son in the faith, a young man whose name was Timothy. And he's writing to Timothy knowing that the end is almost there. How do we know? Because in just a few hours he will say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth in just a few minutes, honey, there is a crown of righteousness which has been laid up for me, which the righteous Lord shall present to me, not just to me though, but all those that have kept the faith and run their race and have finished their course. Now before he goes, he says, now Timothy, I want you and those that come after you to understand one thing. I don't want you to be caught off guard. He said, the end of time shall come. And when the end of days shall come, he said, perilous times shall arise against you. He said, what will those days be like? We are given the identifying fingerprint in two different words in verse number one. Circle them in your Bible. He says, first of all, in the last days. That word last, it's an interesting Greek word, which literally means the lowest grade possible. You know, there's two kinds of cow in this world. There's the kind you get at the high-end restaurants, and then there's the kind you eat at Taco Bell. That kind you get at that fine, fancy establishment, you can tell it's been fed just beautiful grass. It's not that hay-fed kind of cow. It's that grass-fed beef, and it's got them beautiful lines of marbled fat that just run through their veins and sun. That's at the very top. But then you've got the last thing they throw over the fence. They grind all that grade-A dog meat together, and they give it to the Taco Bell, and whenever you people go down late at night and get you a soft taco with just a little bit of cheese on there. What you don't realize is you are eating the lowest of the low. Brothers and sisters, that's what the apostle Paul said the last days would be like. 
They would be the lowest of the low. They would be the last thing over the fence before this whole thing was said and done. You say, how bad are the last days going to be that are upon us? There will never have been another time since the beginning of the earth. And you've got to understand, the earth was so bad in Genesis chapter number 6 that God said, it has repented me that I even made man, and I'm going to end it all with a global flood. And yet these days in the last days will be a lower grade than even the days of Noah. Sodom was so bad that God opened up the heavens, split the earth, and made rain come down in fire and brimstone. And yet the Bible says that these last days will be lower than that. The days that we live in, they are the lowest of the low. They'll be low in a lot of different ways. Number one, they'll be the lowest religious days we have ever seen in our lives. Number two, they will be the lowest social days we will ever see in our lives. They will be the lowest leadership days. Has anybody ever stopped and looked at the elections that we've been through the last 20? Don't get nervous right now when I talk about politics because both sides need a Holy Ghost infused salvation from another world. And I'm looking now at the choices that we have in state competitions, in local competitions. I'm looking in national competitions competitions and I look and say these are our choices because we're in the lowest of the days and let me just hock a hock one over the fence right now if you think that salvation will come through a Republican or a Democrat then you my friend do not realize how low the lowest of the last days are gonna be but then he says in the last days watch this next word perilous. Now, I'm going to show you something, and let me do a little teachy before I do a little preachy. That word perilous is a Greek word, kalipos, and that Greek word is only used one other time in all of the New Testament. It's found in Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 28. The Bible says they are out on the Sea of Galilee and they're going across to the other side and all of a sudden there are, there, there's a man that comes out when they get on the other side and you remember he's possessed with demons. He's the maniac at Gadara and he comes out of the tombs and watch this, he is exceeding fierce. That word fierce is the same Greek word, kalipos. Watch me. Isn't it amazing that the very word used to describe the last days, the only other time it's used is describing a demon-possessed man. So write in your Bible this, this know also that in the last days, demon times shall come. Brothers and sisters, you and I are not living in bad political days. We're living in demon days. You and I are not living in bad church days. We are living in demon days. You and I are not living in bad economic days. We are living in demon days. You and I are not living in bad socionomical days. I'm making up words as I go. You know why? Because these are demon days. You and I are not living where it's just hard to get along with our spouse. We are living against the oppression of the devil, and we are living in demon days. You and I are not raising our children in the midst of tough times. We're trying to raise our children, pushing back the very forces of hell. Know this also, that in the last times, demon days shall come. Brothers and sisters, if you can take one look at the news and think that it's anything other than demonically oppressive, possessed days, then you are as blind as an emu and an ostrich that sticks their head down in the ever-loving sand. Brothers and sisters, we are living in demon days. And every time you see a demon in the New Testament, chaos breaks out. Matthew chapter number 8, a demon man comes out of the tombs and he's ripped off every stitching of his clothes. 
Matthew chapter 8, demons rush out of that man, go into a herd of swine, and those swine cast themselves off the cliff. Chaos. You see a woman that is taken with this demon, and the Bible says they call her Mary Magdalene, the woman possessed with seven devils, and she never could shake it. Chaos. There's a man in the book of Mark possessed with the devil. You know what they called him? A lunatic. Chaos. Brothers and sisters, you and I have learned how to medically, uh, medically give titles to every single thing. We know how to diagnose every single issue. What you and I call disorders and you and I call issues over there, the Bible says that those people are under the very attack of the demons and the devils of hell. You and I are living in a nation where the demons and the devils of hell are raging against us. It may not make us comfortable to talk about that. It may not make us happy to to talk about that but the moment we do not realize what we're fighting we'll never get victory cotton mather the old preacher said this he said the devil is on a leash by god but the closer you get to the end god starts lengthening the leash everywhere we turn we'll see demon days every decision we make we'll be fighting against demon days Every person that tries to rebel against us will be fighting demon days. And if we're not careful, we will not understand what we're dealing with. And I am absolutely stunned at the churches and the preachers living in demon days. And we're talking about checkbooks. Living in demon days. And we're talking about how to have more self-esteem. We're living in demon days, and all we're doing is trying to install air conditioning on the Titanic. You are trying to make comfortable a ship that is on its way down. I hate snakes. I hate everything about a snake. I won't even go into a store where they got snake boots. And they've been skinned, tanned, and rolled over a high. I ain't touching that. I don't like snakes. There's a snake called a hog-nosed viper. Hog-nosed viper has got two defense mechanisms. The first thing it will do is it will strike constantly as you get near it. But when it realizes that it's striking, is not making you go away, it'll roll over, open its mouth, and stick its tongue out and play dead. Hoping that when it's picked up, it will immediately come back to form and pow, bite. For years, the devil has been striking out, and it didn't get anybody's attention. It didn't do any type of damage to the kingdom of light. So you know what he did? He kindly laid over and he began to camouflage himself through our entertainment, camouflage himself through the way that we did things, camouflage himself through our government, camouflage himself in our relationships, camouflage himself in all of these different things that the world and the devil and the flesh, we just love. And now all of a sudden we can't figure out since we held this thing in our hands and it started biting us and we can't figure out where all the life went we can't figure out where all the joy went we can't figure out where all the peace went all of a sudden now in america we're waking up and we can't even feed our kids but yet we've got enough this we can send and sink down and study how squid like to remotely go inside of boats and yet we've got children that don't have enough money to feed themselves breakfast lunch or dinner except that they're fed in our school systems beloved we ought to be able to feed every child and clothe every child child if we weren't studying the mating rituals of squirrels and we weren't thinking about what happens when you put copper in water. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what we're dealing with? We're dealing with demon days. You know why? The devil has come to steal and to kill and to destroy and that's why our kids don't have life. We've handed them a dead snake only to realize it wasn't dead and now it's biting and now it's charging and now it's eating us alive. Brothers and sisters, in the last days, demons days will be upon us and there'll be chaos brothers and sisters where are the people 
We're the people that say, what shall we do? How then shall we live? Beloved, our poor children are starving to death. We have single mothers that can barely make it. We have churches that are holding on by a thread. Families that are doing all they can to make ends meet. And it's just chaos. What shall we do in the last days? Paul tells us, number one, he says in the last days you've got to understand there'll be a cultural corruption. In verse number two down through verse number four, he says the overarching theme of the last days is men shall be lovers of their own selves. They'll be covetous, they'll be boasters, they'll be proud, they'll be blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Whenever Paul writes those things, those are 19 characteristics as he goes down through there. Do you know who he was talking about? He was talking about Nero the Roman emperor. Nero began reigning at 16 years old, and he did it with the help of his mother, Agrippina. And Agrippina, she came, and only five years, he couldn't take it anymore with her. After five years, he had his mother assassinated, disobedient to parents. At 21, he began to sneak out of the palace in Rome at night, and he would find women that were running, going about the streets that were married, trying to make ends meet, and he would seduce them away from their husbands. That's when Paul said he'll lead captive silly women laden with sins. He would then take little boys, and he would turn them into slaves for himself without natural affection. Beloved, the day you and I live in, there is a corruption that is sweeping across this blessed United States. There is a corruption that is moving. And now you and I have moved beyond homosexuality. And we've moved beyond these things. And mark it down. I am not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But I'm telling you by the end of my lifetime, they'll be justifying relationships with children. They'll be justifying pedophilia. Why? Because the lower you get, they'll be without natural affection. You and I, we've got now in Guilford County, where I'm from, in Guilford County, where I'm from. Let me tell you, in Guilford County, North Carolina, where I'm from, one of our uh, public school teachers, what, she is a fantastic believer. And time out, let me just say something to you public school teachers. We need to pray for you. You are having to fight a battle that some of us cannot even comprehend. It's about time the people of God lay down themselves and say, I'm praying for public school teachers. I'm praying for public school workers because they are in a place they never thought they'd be in Guilford County. Do you know what they've done? It first started in North Carolina with this bathroom. And I'm getting mad the more I'm talking about this thing. In Guilford County, it started in North Carolina with going to whatever bathroom you want. Do you know what they're doing in the public schools in Guilford County right now? They're putting litter boxes out for the kids who identify as cats. Cats. Without, beloved, it would be funny if it wasn't true. We have so cascaded down this corruption that now we have children. No longer do they know that. It's not even about gender. They don't even know species anymore. And yet you and I want to look and say, it's no, 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 no. It's not a stage they're going through. What's happened is you've taken truth out of the very fiber and fabric. And now when the fabric is ripped apart at the seams, we can't figure out why it falls apart. 
Brothers and sisters, there is a culture. Listen, the spirit of Rome is alive and well in the United States of America. That's why this very week, just a few days ago, there was a man walked into a house and murdered six people. Four of them were children in cold blood. Walked in, put a gun to their little heads, and pulled the trigger and took the life right out of four innocent children. Turned around and walked right out the door. That's why in New York City people heard screams coming from an apartment and they stayed in their apartment turned the television up so they could not hear the screams. When the police finally came, they realized that a man had gone into the apartment cut the woman's head off and she was screaming because before he did it, he was torturing her and yet they turned the television up. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why last night in Nashville, there were people on the street sticking needles in their arms and they think it's okay because there is a corruption that goes further and further the further you go. He said in the last days there'll be cultural corruption. Then he gets into verse number five and he says the second thing there'll be is after the culture begins to corrupt, there'll be church counterfeits. He says in verse number five, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You would think that the church, the darker it gets, would shine brighter. But Paul said at the very end, they'll look like a flashlight, but got no battery on the inside. I'm not a Halloween fan. I don't dress up. I, I don't dress up. But every year I love going through the store just to see what kind of stupid costumes they got in there. Knowing that there is an adult somewhere that's going to spend their hard-earned money and put that thing on. I saw one last year. The Incredible Hulk. It was green. Son, it had pectoralis major muscles that, st- I mean, just m- m- it had a nine pack of abs on that costume. The biceps on that thing were massive. I'm talking the leg muscles looked like telephone poles. The back ripples just kept on going. I bet when somebody walked out in that costume, I bet somebody thought, whoa. What a mean-looking man. Can you imagine when that man came out, went downstairs, and his wife looked at him and said, Boy, you look great. I've never seen you so buff. And then she took her arms around him and hugged him, only to realize... It was empty. It had a form, but no power. That night, that man had on that costume, walking up and down the street collecting candy. Can you imagine if a telephone pole had fallen down onto a vehicle somewhere and there were little children on the inside saying, please help us, please help us. They would have looked at that man in that costume and said, here comes somebody that can help them, only to realize it was a form, but it had no real power. And that night, had there been somebody that needed extra muscle, they would have looked at him and said, he's got the appearance of power, but they would say it's just a form, but it's got no power. He said in the last days, there'll be a whole lot of religious people and a whole lot of churches that have got the form of power. They've got the form of being able to do something. But when the rubber meets the road, there is absolutely nothing powerful about them. They've got the appearance of religion. But when somebody comes with a real hurting heart, they don't have the ability to change that person. They've got a form of of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. When a family comes and a husband and wife don't know that there's any hope beyond tomorrow and they come in that day, they say, this is the house of God. This is where I can find joy and strength. And they go in only to realize it's a form, but no power. Do you know what the word power means in that verse, verse number 5? It literally is the Greek word dunamis, and we get the, the word dynamite. 
Dynamite is a life-altering chemical. When dynamite does its job, it will change the situation. Did you know that dynamite has the same component makeup as an M80? Don't you Tennessee rednecks act like y'all don't know what an M80 is? Some of y'all couldn't even get your concealed carry because you stuck one in a post office box somewhere. And M80 is a little firecracker. If you take an M80 and light it and hold it in an open hand, an open palm like that, it's just going to burn the palm of your hand. But your body will remain intact. Why? Not a whole lot of power. You take the same palm and take a stick of dynamite and stick it in the palm of your hand. And my friend, your life will never be the same. I don't want to be an M80 kind of believer. I'm not looking to be an M80 kind of preacher. I'm not looking to have a form and be a little pop every now and again. Son, I want to have so much Holy Ghost power inside of my life that when people come, they've got to make a choice. Am I going to, am I going to stay or am I going to go? Am I going to walk with God or am I going to go my own way? I want to have so much Holy Ghost dynamite power that whenever my life is put up against a hard place, either I'm moving or it's moving. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got far too many churches and they've got a little pop here and they've got a little pop there. But I didn't grow up in some little pop religion. Honey, I grew up in old-fashioned Holy Ghost dynamite religion. When the preacher got up, he may not know about the ins and the outs of the world, but he'd been in the Holy of Holies, and God had stuck uh, stuck a stick of dynamite right down in the gable into his soul. And if you got close enough to him, something was going to change. I want to be a part of a church that doesn't have a little snap and a little crackle and a little pop here and there. Now, you may not light off dynamite every single time, but it's a whole lot easier to light a little M80 here and there. I don't want to be the kind of church where every service an M80 pop is loaded out and M80 pop is over here. But I want our church to be the kind of church we may not do it all the time, but when God gets ready to do something, honey, it's going to change the scene. It's going to change the scenario. I don't want to be a counterfeit in the day that I live. He said, but in the last days, everywhere, You're going to see church counterfeits. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something. I tell Pastor Dave this all the time. It ain't hard to grow a church in the last days. You preach the truth, and there'll be so many deadbeat places out there, they'll come in droves because they're starving in the land. It's not difficult to build a church. You've just got to make sure you don't just have a form. But then number three, he says, after you get past that church counterfeit, you're going to get down, and in verse 12, there's going to be a controlled contempt. Watch what he says in verse 12. Yea, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It doesn't say, leave that up here, fellas. It doesn't say all those that are Christians are going to suffer persecution. It says those people that are living for Christ. We call those the remnant, the faithful, the true blue, the dyed in the wool, the believe it all, the ones that are always there, the ones that don't know much, but what they know, they know it. The ones that just believe it. The ones that are just happy. The ones their lives have been turned upside down. I'm talking about the fanatics. I'm talking about the people, they are all in. I'm talking about the people that don't have to be convinced. I'm talking about the people that don't have to be smoothed around. I'm talking about the people you don't have to pump them and pump them. There's just something on the inside that connects them. I'm talking about all those that live godly in Christ. I'm talking about those mamas and daddies that look out there and say, I don't really care what you your newfangled book says about how to raise these youngins. I've been taught to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and that's what I'm going to do. He said, whenever you get ready to do that, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He says to the man and the woman who doesn't care what kind of Roman society we're in, they say, no, we're going to be faithful to one another. We're going to love one another through the ups and through the downs, through the good and through the bad. We're not swinging over there, and we're not shacking over 
are there, we're going to live for Jesus Christ. He says, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And listen to me now. It may not be the kind of persecution that takes your head to a chopping block. It may be the kind of persecution in America that doesn't allow you to be a part of their talk, doesn't allow you to be a part of their text thread, doesn't allow you to be a part of their dinner party. Why? Because you have chosen to live godly in Christ Jesus. He says, but you shall suffer persecution. You realize there was a law that was passed back in December. It went into effect in Denmark, and there was a bill that was put out in Denmark, and this is what it said. It said that there was a bill banning the burning of all religious text, except the Bible. It's a crime to burn the Quran, but it's religious expression to burn because all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall. You don't believe me? Let's play a game. I will take you and buy your dinner. Hop in my vehicle and we will make our way down to the town square in Lebanon, Tennessee. One day I'm going to get y'all to put that A back in that word, but it ain't going to be today. And let's go down there and let's hold up a sign that says equality for all. Believe what you want to believe. You'll stay there most of the day. People probably won't bother you too much. Then let's go back next Sunday and let's paint us up a sign That says, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Hold that same sign up on that same town square and watch what happens, baby doll. Because there is something on the inside of humanity that repels the name of Jesus Christ. It despises and fears the very name of Jesus Christ. During the Boxer Rebellion of the the early 1900s, the Boxer Rebellion in China, they went into a local mission church. And in that mission church, there were people that were inside. And they had guns all around those people. And this is what they did. They put a cross in the dirt outside of the one door in and out of that little mission house. And this is what those guards said. They said, if you stay in this house, we will shoot you. But if you're willing to trample over the cross and leave this house, you can have your life. There were five or six people that were willing to do it. And they trampled over that cross and they made their way out. But there was one little Chinese girl. She said, I cannot do it. I will not trample beneath my feet the very cross that my Savior bore upon his back. She bowed inside of that little mission house and before she knew it there were 57 other people that were bowing around her do you know why because there is something powerful when somebody says I don't care what they say about me I don't care what they do to me that's why little Cassie Bernal in 1999 in Columbine High School whenever two men Eric Harrison Dylan Klebold they walk into there and they look at her knowing that she'd been in the FCA knowing that she'd been a believer they look at her And they say, will you deny the very name of the Lord Jesus Christ? She said, I will not do it. They took a shotgun and laid it to her head. Oh, because she was unwilling to bow to the very name and bow to the very belief that there is any God besides the one true God. But all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But he keeps going. He says, after that controlled contempt in verse number 13, there'll be a cascading confusion. Watch what he says in verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, beloved, I want you to circle that word evil right there. Draw you a line out to the side. Because that Greek word for that word evil, that's not the normal Greek word used for evil. The normal Greek word used for evil describes vile, wretched, sinful. But the word used there for evil, it literally means agitators, pokers, prodders, annoyances. 
Somebody that pushes you in a direction. Paul said in the last days, he said these people are going to be poking you slowly to seduce you. That word seducers, it was an old Greek word. It was a, it was a job. We would call it a carnival act. It was an enchanter. He would juggle while he was spewing out his incantations. Here is what the last days would be like. Paul said there would be so much confusion in the last days, and the way that you would believe this is they would push you slowly by impressing you with what they could do. They had to have all the juggling acts, and they just pulled you. They had to have all of the big stuff, and they just kept pulling you. They had to impress you, and they had to draw you in, beloved. If there is one word that describes the modern-day church of Jesus Christ, every single Sunday is another juggling act, and every single Sunday is another show. If they can't impress you this way, they'll impress you that way. What happened to old-fashioned Holy Ghost Church where what you did is you came in and sang the songs of the faith, and you gave your tithes and your offerings, and you listened to the preaching of the Word of God, and you go out and live and become doers of the Word? And not. That's what real religion is. It's when Whenever you go out and love somebody more like Jesus Christ, you don't have to be impressed. You don't have to be pleased. It doesn't have to be your favorite anything. He said, but in the last days, these people be slowly pulling people. Can I tell you what has shut down the majority of tiny little churches all over America? And tiny little churches all over America are what built America. It's because those poor little preachers could not compete with the juggling act of the mighty. And in the last day, there was so much confusion. People didn't realize that they'd been pulled in the wrong direction. I read about this girl in college, and she had a big K on her sweatshirt. And she walked around with this big K, and nobody ever asked her what that K stood for. And so one old boy asked her one day, he said, Man, what's that K stand for on your shirt? She said, it stands for confused. He scratched his head and he said, Ma'am, confused doesn't start with a K. She said, you don't know how confused I am. <laughs> it's one old boy, he, he wrote to this magazine. How many of you remember the old Sears and Roebuck catalog days? I'm looking at your age, right? The, how many of you just don't lie to me? You remember them old Sears and Roebuck catalog days. We had people in our church back in Greensboro, some of the old timers, they worked at the Sears and Roebuck distribution center for the East Coast, which was there in Greensboro. And what she would do, to those of you that have no idea, imagine Amazon in a book about that big. And you would go through this. And the crazy thing about the Sears and Roebuck catalog is they'd put Everything on that. They would shove as much stuff on one page as possible. This one old boy wanted a birdhouse. So Marty, he ordered a birdhouse from the catalog. He'd never built a birdhouse before, but he'd always wanted to. And so he ordered this thing, and he got this birdhouse, and he started following the instructions. I mean, he was following those things, and he built it. It got bigger and bigger and bigger, and he went to hang it in a tree. He got so mad. The wind kept blowing out. It barely him stay in the tree. He wrote back to the Sears and Roebuck company. He said, I am so mad at you all. He said, this birdhouse is the biggest, ugliest thing. It ain't no birds come near it. Sears and Roebuck wrote him back and said, sir, we are so sorry. There's been a horrible mistake. I know you ordered a birdhouse, but we actually sent you the kit for a sailboat. He said, but don't be worried. He said, you ought to see how mad that boy is that, uh, that ordered the sailboat down at the yacht club the other day when he was trying to race with everybody else. <laughs> Can I tell you something? If you're doing what they say and getting something that's not in the book, you're building with the wrong stuff. 
And that's why our marriages and our families and our culture are more religious than they've ever been, but yet we're not getting any type of righteousness anywhere because there is so much confusion. As you go down the line, you can get online and see everything, but yet you don't even know what's true anymore. Now, number five, and I'm done. I said all that to say this. The fifth thing that we find in this passage is down in verse number 14. There is a clear command. What do you do when you see perilous times on you? What are we supposed to do as a church when we see confusion everywhere? What are we supposed to do when everybody is getting more corrupt? Watch what he says in verse number 14. He says, but continue. But continue. He said, I know the culture is moving this way, but turn around and go back where you came from. He said, I know people are moving this direction, but go back and go in that direction. He says this word, but continue. Circle that word, write a line out to the side. Do you know what the word continue means in the Greek? It means to be permanently fixed. Don't move. Do not alter. How many of you have ever been to New York City? In New York City, in New York Harbor, off of Ellis Island, there is a 301-foot statue. She's called Lady Liberty, the Statue of Liberty. Did you know that the Statue of Liberty, the tower itself, the actual statue, weighs 450,000 pounds? The girth and the size of that statue in the wind there in New York Harbor. The ability of that wind to blow that statue, even though it's big, is uncanny. So do you know what they did to keep the wind from blowing the statue? Lady Liberty is attached to what they call Liberty Foundation. Do you know how much Liberty Foundation weighs according to the National Park Service? The base of Liberty Foundation weighs 54 million pounds of concrete, copper, iron, steel, and rebar. Do you know what keeps Lady Lip? Now, some of y'all are gonna go home and look that up. Go ahead. I looked it up 18 times. I asked Chris Smith to verify. I even got Sue Ann involved in this thing because I wanted to make sure that I was absolutely right. Do you know how a 301 foot statue that weighs 450,000 pounds doesn't topple over in the 70 mile an hour winds that blow? I'll tell you why. Because, honey, at her root, son, she is anchored down to something that is far bigger. And she is. She is hooked down to something that the wind cannot move and the waves cannot move. Something that the atmosphere cannot change. Honey, she's rooted down to 54 million pounds of iron and rebar and concrete. How in the world can we continue whenever they say that marriage is no longer between a man and a woman? We continue in the way that we've always been. What do we do when they say you cannot raise your children the way the Bible says? We continue and keep on doing it. What do they do when they say you can't have a church that loves God and reaches people and do it in a way that your grandma and your grandma? We continue moving in that direction. What do you do when they say you can't live for God in 2020? We continue and keep on staying steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain. I'm looking for some people that say this world is a rocking and the winds are blowing but I'm going to continue. I'm going to anchor down in these last days. I'm not moving. Paul said, now Timothy, he said, you're going to be tempted to turn, but continue. You're going to be tempted to move, but continue. Continue in what, Paul? Paul. Continue in the things that thou hast both learned and been assured of. How that from a child thou hast been taught the holy scriptures. 
For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Brother Tyler, what are you saying? I ain't been here long enough, so I just feel like I need to say a couple things. What shall we continue in? We shall continue in all Scripture. Laying it upon the foundation of everything that we do. For all Scripture is given by the breath of God. Well, Tyler, what, what are we going to do? We'll continue. What do we teach our children? That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Who are we going to tell our teenagers? That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What are we going to tell sinners that come in? That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What are we going to tell the Wilson County Association? That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What are we going to say to the convention when they don't like the way we... That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What are we going to do when the state house says you can't? We're going to say all Scripture is given by inspiration. of What are we going to do when our children say I have found a better way? We're going to say all Scripture is given by inspiration. of What are we going to do when the churches around us say we don't do that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Because brothers and sisters, the last days that be upon us, they will blow against our churches and they will blow against our souls and they will blow against our lives and they will try to wreak havoc upon our families and it will try to very to corrupt the very mind and the spirit that God has given. But I have determined inside of my family that I will continue saying that we will build our lives on this blessed old book. I have determined as a pastor, as long as you allow me to pastor this blessed flock, that we will stand upon all scripture is given by inspiration of God and when the day comes when you say we no longer feel that way brother Tyler it's time for you to move on we no longer believe that I'll go out with my head held high saying I know that all scripture is still given by inspiration of God and when the convention says we no longer believe that way we'll stand up with our shoulders back and our eyes lifted up to heaven saying all scripture is still given by inspiration of God Beloved, I will not turn. We will not bow. We will not bend. If we stand alone, we're still founded on something.